Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Knowledge Exchange series presented by the Waterloo Wellington Older Adult Strategy in celebration of Seniors Month. Today's webinar is titled Healthy Aging, Small Steps Lead to Great Rewards. My name is Don Wildfong, and I'm the uh, implementation facilitator for the Waterloo Wellington Older Adult Strategy. It's important for me to let you know that today's session is being recorded. Uh, you are not visible and you can't be heard. The way we'll interact today, and we encourage you to do so, is through the question and answer section uh, of the Zoom platform. So you'll see a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we encourage you to uh, pose questions for our presenters today, because as you'll see in a moment, they have a very rich background and, uh, and wisdom that we can all benefit from here today as we talk about healthy aging. We're pleased to be joined today by our facilitator, Susie Gregg, a colleague of mine from the Canadian Mental Health Association. Uh, Susie is the Waterloo Wellington Geriatric Clinical Resource Consultant for Primary Care. She also works very uh, directly uh, in a collaborative fashion uh, with the older adult service sector. We'll also be joined today by presenters. Um, you'll see here we have two kinesiologists and a registered dietitian. So we have Rasha El Khattab, a PhD candidate from the University of Waterloo and the Faculty of Applied Health Sciences in the Department of Kinesiology. She'll be followed by Kathy Summer Summers, who's a registered kinesiologist and certified in biofeedback, stress management and high performance clinic in Guelph is where Kathy works. And Kathy Lepp, who's a registered dietitian and comes to us from the University of Waterloo this morning. So without further ado, I think we'll get going. One more, I guess, uh, piece of housekeeping, and it's to let you know that this, uh, you will receive following this webinar or this session, a recording of the session. You'll receive the slide deck that we're presenting today and an evaluation uh, for this session. So you should likely look to receive that tomorrow morning, but I'll remind you again about that later on. So in today's session, we're hoping that we'll learn about the 24-hour movement guidelines and their application to older adults. We'll learn about healthy exercise practices, and healthy sleep practices for older adults, and, healthy, and we'll learn about healthy nutrition for older adults. So as you can see, we've got a very well-rounded uh, view of health this morning, and um, we're looking forward to getting right into it. So I'll pass things over to my colleague, Susie Gregg, for further introductions and some opening comments. Thank you. Thanks so much, Don. It's a pleasure to be with all of you this morning. I'm really thankful that I actually can see my co-speakers alongside because otherwise I'd be talking to a computer screen and um, appreciate so much those of you who are joining us. I think we have a great group this morning. It's my understanding we have over 40 people joining us on Zoom. So please welcome. And I know you will find the session exceptionally refreshing and thought provoking. I wanted to give you a little bit of background before we started about the 24-hour movement guidelines. And these, these guidelines really piqued my interest. It must have been back in October when I attended a session that was presented specifically on what is unique about these guidelines for older adults. So let me give you a little bit of background and apologies as I shift my head back and forth between my notes. It's really important to me that I give you the accurate background as um, instead of just my interpretation of the background of these guidelines. So the 24 hour movement guidelines, interestingly enough, are a partnership between the Canadian Society for Exercise Physiology, the Public Health Agency of Canada, Queen's University and Participation. And for those of you who grew up and uh, watched TV in the 70s, you'll remember Hal and Joanne and their body break moments. So I was thrilled to know that these guidelines took into account all of the work that had happened with Participation over the years. The true impetus for these guidelines is really about translating advances in exercise science research into the promotion of fitness, performance, and health outcomes for Canadians. And what makes today's presentation unique is two points. First, the guidelines are now uh, adapted for older adults, 65 plus. So you'll hear about that today. 
And we really felt strongly from the, uh, from the promotion side of the older adult strategy, as well as the knowledge exchange, that we broaden the guidelines ourselves locally to include some background on nutrition. So for those of you that will go on and do a little bit more research about the 24-hour movement guidelines, they don't actually specifically include nutrition recommendations, but we felt strongly that was important to include. So again, a little bit more background. The guidelines were developed through evidence, expert consensus, uh, of which you have some folks on today's call or in today's session who were involved in that expert consensus, uh, stakeholder consultation, and the consideration of values and preferences, which I think is actually important as we think about the adaptation of these guidelines for older adults. They um, build upon research background, again, on the optimal amount of physical activity, sedentary behavior, and sleep. And as I mentioned, the addition of nutrition that we've added locally. So truly, it is no longer just about the number of minutes you exercise, which we hear so much about, but it's really about movement across a 24-hour day with the addition of good, healthy eating guidelines. So with that being said, we're going to move into our first speaker. And Don, if you don't mind advancing our slide, I'm going to introduce Russia to you. So Russia completed her Master of Science in Rehab Science, so Rehabilitation Science, at the University of Toronto. As a current PhD student in kinesiology at the University of Waterloo, so we have a lot of local flavor here speaking with you today, Russia's thesis aims to examine considerations for designing and managing resistance training, interve intervention studies involving both the general adult population as well as those with chronic health conditions. Overall, Russia's research will inform resistance training interventions with respect to timing, benefits, and their proper reporting of harms. So it's my pleasure to introduce Russia to you this morning. And Russia, please feel free to add anything else about yourself that I may have missed or that might be relevant to the group. And welcome. Thank you, Susie, for the int introduction. Uh, I'm happy to be here and excited to share with you uh, the guidelines with respect to physical activity and sedentary behavior, specifically for older adults uh, who are uh, 65 years uh, of age or older. So uh, my involvement with the Canadian 24-hour movement guidelines was to conduct an overview of systematic reviews, which is just a study uh, that uh, looks at the effect of resistance training on health outcomes uh, in adults who are 18 years of age or older. And for resistance training, it's just used interchangeably with the word strength training. And I will discuss the guidelines for that in the upcoming slides. So physical activity is divided into multiple components. So we have light intensity physical activity, moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity, resistance training, some people like to call it strength training, as well as balance and functional training. For light intensity physical activity, it is assessed with an absolute scale of less than three METs. Now, METs stands for metabolic equivalence, and you wanna think of one MET as the energy you use when you're resting or sitting still. So if an activity is said to have a value of three METs, that means you're exerting three times the energy than you would if you were sitting still. Another way to assess light intensity physical activity is to use a relative scale, and that would be less than five on a scale of zero to 10. Some examples of activities that are considered light intensity include activities of daily living, like getting dressed, grooming, um, casual walking, as well as standing, uh, performing household chores, or uh, gardening. Now, light intensity physical activity is associated with a substantial reduction in health risk, and that occurs in a dose response manner. Meaning the more you engage in light intensity physical activity, the greater the reduction in health risk. Now, any amount of light physical activity is considered beneficial. So it's the whole idea of some movement is better than no movement. And that you want to reallocate your time from being sedentary and putting it into en engaging in activities that are considered light intensity. And this has been associated with health benefits. 
So the guideline recommendations indicate that a healthy 24 hours for older adults should include several hours of light physical activities. And again, that does include standing. And this was the first time that the health benefits of light physical activity were recognized in the guidelines. Now for moderate to vigorous physical activity, you can assess moderate intensity uh, on an absolute scale of three to 5.9 METs, or you can use a relative scale and that would be a five or a six on a scale of zero to 10. For vigorous intensity, it would be an absolute scale of six METs or more, and a relative scale uh, that begins at seven or eight, and that's on a scale of zero to 10. Another way to assess whether you are engaging in moderate or vigorous intensity is to use uh, something called a talk test. So if you are engaging in an activity that is considered moderate intensity, you should be able to talk but not sing. And if you're engaging in an activity that is considered to be at a vigorous intensity, you should not be able to say more than a few words without pausing for a breath. Now, moderate to vigorous physical activity is, a, is associated with a substantial reduction in health risk. And again, any amount of moderate to vigorous physical activity is considered beneficial and that uh, reallocating your time from being sedentary or from engaging in a light intensity physical activity and putting it into engaging in activities that are considered moderate to vigorous physical activity uh, is associated with greater health benefits. So the guideline recommendation for older adults indicates that a healthy 24 hours should include moderate to vigorous physical activity such that you accumulate at least 150 minutes per week. So that's about an average of 20 minutes a day. So for resistance training, uh, which I mentioned earlier, which some people like to call strength training, uh, you wanna think about your body as resistance. So if you're doing a push up, you're using your body as resistance or like a squat, or you can use some form of external resistance like holding a dumbbell or a kettlebell. So all of those are examples of strength training. Now resistance training was favorably associated with health outcomes uh, that are related to all-cause mortality, incident cardiovascular disease, as well as physical functioning. However, at this time, there is insufficient evidence uh, to recommend a specific type, intensity, or duration of resistance training. However, resistance training did improve muscle strength in both younger as well as older adults, but the harmful events that could occur because of resistance training were not being consistently monitored or reported in the uh, currently available studies. Now the guideline recommendation for older adults indicates that a healthy 24 hours should include muscle strengthening activities that use major muscle groups and that should be conducted at least twice a week. Uh, finally for balance and functional training, uh, the uh, findings show that, uh, sorry, Don, could you? Yeah. The findings show that uh, it did reduce the rates of falls and the number of people who fell, as well as it improved physical functioning and physical activity. And similar to resistance training, um, the uh, harmful events uh, were not being consistently monitored or reported in the available studies. At this time, there is insufficient evidence with respect to the type or dose of balance and functional training that should be recommended. So the guideline recommendations uh, for older adults indicates that a healthy 24 hours uh, should include physical activities that challenge balance. And this is applicable for all older adults, regardless of their mobility status or their fall risk. Now for uh, sedentary behavior, which I will touch a little bit uh, more about, it is basically uh, um, defined as any waking behavior that has an energy expenditure that is less than or equal to 1.5 METs. And it is performed in a sitting, lying, or reclining posture. Now high levels of sedentary behavior are associated with negative health outcomes and that does not come as a surprise. And so you wanna break up or reduce sedentary behavior in order to benefit body composition and cardiometabolic risk. There's also a dose uh, response relationship between sedentary behavior and mortality, uh, indicating that if you engage in longer periods of sedentary behavior, your risk of mortality increases. 
Also, the risk of mortality increases even more rapidly above thresholds that are approximately eight hours a day of total sedentary behavior and three hours a day of TV viewing. So the guideline recommendations uh, indicate that a healthy 24 hours uh, should include limiting sedentary behavior to eight hours or less, and this should not include more than three hours of um, recreational screen time. And you want to break up those long periods of sitting as often as possible. There are also some other highlights that were included in the guidelines to uh, promote physical activity. Uh, so it indicates at the very top of the guidelines that to achieve health benefits, you should uh, be physically active each day and you want to aim to minimize sedentary behavior and that you want to replace sedentary behavior uh, with either a light intensity physical activity or a moderate to vigorous uh, intensity physical activity. Also at the very bottom, it uh, encourages you that uh, even if you cannot meet those guidelines, just progressing towards those targets can result in health benefits. So there is no lower threshold uh, to achieve health benefits. And again, it's the same idea of some movement is better than no movement and just aim to progress towards those guidelines, even if you cannot meet them. So in conclusion, if you meet or even move towards the guidelines, uh, you will experience a range of physical and mental health benefits. I just want to um, acknowledge the guideline leadership team and the consensus panel, and thank you all for your time. Thank you so much, Russia. Really appreciate the information you shared. And I can um, almost guarantee that there will be questions that will emerge as people begin to sort of percolate on the information you shared. And I really appreciated the comment, you know, progressing towards targets is the most important and some movement is better than no movement. So with that in mind, we are going to move into our next speaker, who is Kathy Summers. And a little bit of background about Kathy. Kathy is a registered kinesiologist who is certified in biofeedback. Uh, Kathy Summers, she runs the Stress Management and High Performance Clinic in Guelph, and since 1998 has been providing the Better Sleep Program for adults in Guelph and Waterloo Region. So it's my pleasure to introduce Kathy to you today, who will share with you more information related to the sleep component of the 24-hour guidelines. Welcome, Kathy. Hello, everybody. It's great to see you. Do you wish that you had 10 more minutes of sleep last night? Has your sleep changed during COVID-19? Usually, at any given time in North America, one third of adults are having difficulty with sleep. However, during COVID, there's been such a great increase in uncertainty, worry, anxiety, and stress, that that number has increased and now it's about 47% or more of adults are having sleep difficulties. And it seems to be worse for women. We all know that sleep has a huge impact on our mood and mental functioning. Insufficient sleep also impacts our health and activity levels. And it's for this reason that it's an important part of Canada's new 24-hour movement guidelines. These sleep recommendations in the guidelines came from a team headed by Dr. Sapu at University of Ottawa, who recently pooled the sleep data of more than 4,437,100 adults living in communities across 30 countries to see which factors have sleep associated with good health. So in adults age 65 plus, they found that generally having seven to eight hours of sleep a day, a 24 hour day, was most favorably associated with good health. Keep in mind that this does not necessarily mean seven to eight straight hours of sleep. It can be a total of your nighttime sleep added with your naps. So getting less than seven hours, is a concern because it is associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, type two diabetes, obesity, greater risk of falls and accidents and mortality from all causes. The mechanisms of 
how lack of sleep may relate to these health problems is basically understood. But how having more than eight hours of sleep is associated with poor health is still a mystery to us. Getting more than eight hours of sleep is associated with a greater risk of cardiovascular disease, falls, mortality, and in women, a greater risk of osteoporosis and obesity. Please note that I'm not saying sleep is a cause of these health conditions, just that too little or too much sleep seems to be associated with these conditions. And so this has led to our first recommendation of having seven to eight hours of sleep in a 24 hour day. That can be the total of night sleep plus naps. Now this is a general guideline and it's important to consider individual differences. What are your sleep needs? These are genetically determined. Einstein always said that nine hours of sleep let him work and feel his best. So if your lifetime experience tells you that you're a long sleeper like Einstein, then use that knowledge to set your personal guideline at nine hours. Similarly, if you're a short sleeper like Thomas Edison, then set your guideline for what you need. Seven to eight hours is a general guideline. Now, Chapu next looked at bedtimes and consistency of bedtimes. Next slide, please. Do you go to bed at different times on different nights? Do you get immersed in activities or socializing, even if it's online socializing during COVID-19, like this person staying up late, even after one or two o'clock in the morning? Do you sleep in on weekends? Next slide, please. Research tells us that poor sleep is associated with later sleep timing. That means going to bed at later times. It's also associated with greater sleep variability, meaning that you're inconsistent in the times that you go to bed and the time that you wake up. And this inconsistency is most common in night owls, in people who live alone, people who are stressed or depressed or experience health conditions. Adverse health outcomes are also associated with social jet lag, which means having different times to wake up and go to bed on weekends or days off compared to the other days of the week. Maybe you're not experiencing very much social jet lag. It tends to diminish a lot upon retirement. All of these items get our circadian rhythm or our physiological body rhythms out of sync, and that could lead to sleep disturbances, metabolic and health impairments. Thus comes to recommendation number two, have a consistent bedtime where you avoid going to bed too late and you have a consistent wake up time. Now you probably are wondering how late is late, what's an ideal bedtime, what's an ideal getting up time, but the sleep studies didn't look at it this way. They were really looking to report what were linear associations and behaviors that are most associated with poor health. And so Chapu concluded his report by saying, future researchers should provide us with benchmarks or target times. So we need to stay tuned for those. Now, for people who are short on sleep, there are a few studies now showing that catching up on your sleep on the weekend is very favorable for good health. If you haven't fallen asleep on me already, you realize I have just contradicted myself. After recommending earlier that you should have consistent bedtime and wake up time, I'm now suggesting you may sleep in on the weekends. So we need more research on the NIST. In the meantime, listen to your body and try your own experiments. To sum up, the sleep experiments that have come then down to the recommendations in Canada's 24 hour guidelines are to get seven to eight hours of sleep in a 24 hour day. Remembering it does not have to be all at once, having one or more naps during your day, if each nap is less than 30 minutes long is just fine. And have a consistent bedtime and consistent wake up time 
if you're not currently doing this, the easiest way to start is to consider your current waking up pattern, set a realistic new wake up time, and have an obnoxious alarm clock that you set for that new time that makes you wake up. You put the alarm clock far away from your bed, so you have to get out of bed to turn it off. So you get up at the same time every day, you'll start getting tired about the same time every evening, starting having a more consistent time going to bed. If you're thinking about changing your sleep behaviors, there are a few caveats, especially if you're a person who says that you should be getting instant results, you should be getting a perfect sleep, you should fall asleep instantly. Be kind to yourself. Are you aware that it can take three to four weeks to develop a consistent sleep pattern? So give yourself time. Did you know it usually takes 10 to 20 minutes to fall asleep or to fall back to sleep? So avoid expecting I shall fall asleep as soon as my head touches the pillow. And because we know that sleep is impacted by pain, by stress, by events happening today or things I'm apprehensive or excited about tomorrow, we avoid expecting a great sleep every night. The sleep researchers suggest that we aim for five good nights out of seven and make it more realistic in the expectations we're putting on ourselves. So if you would like some more information, especially if you'd like the articles by Chapu's team that informed the 24-hour guidelines, you can contact me at ksummers at uoguelph.ca. If you have general questions about sleep, there are great tips on sleep on at canada.ca and mysleepwell.ca. If you're a person with insomnia, if it takes a long time to fall asleep or fall back to sleep, or you don't get much energy from your sleep, the Waterloo Wellington Self-Management Program has a better sleep program for tips on decreasing insomnia. It's at www www.selfmanagement.ca. One of many great programs that the Waterloo Wellington Self-Management Program has for adults in our region to learn strategies that improve sleep. I hope that you make sleep a priority because small hinges swing open big doors and starting with just one small step today could lead to a big sleep improvement or consistency over time. What is one thing that you could start on today to begin improving your sleep? And now I'll turn it back to Susie. Thank you so much, Kathy. I really, really appreciated two pieces. The one was the whole release from us for us of I shall. I think many of us have put that wording inadvertently in our lifestyles. I shall fall asleep after 10 to 15 minutes. I shall exercise. And in a moment with our next speaker, another Kathy, we'll be talking about I shall eat. But I like that release from that pressure. And I think that's what we're seeing now consistently through some of the two presentations we've seen is those small steps make a big difference. And I, that analogy of swinging open the, um, you know, the, the hinge was quite profound. So thank you so much, Kathy. And again, reminder for our participants here today, please, as you're thinking of questions that come up because we're holding them to the end, please add them to our question and a chat room. Um, and we'll also open up at the end for the questions. So it's my pleasure now to move us into the next segment of our session, which again is outside of the current 24-hour guidelines, but we felt very strongly was equally important to address today. I have the pleasure of introducing to you today to Kathy Lepp. And Kathy is a registered dietitian with a plethora of background in hospital, pharmacy and community as a dietitian. She's currently engaged with the University of Waterloo in providing nutrition education and advice to older adults who are participating in the Move Strong at Home research project, which is aimed at optimizing protein intake. So welcome to our second Kathy today, and we look forward to hearing about um, some suggestions around best eating habits. Thanks, Kathy. 
Okay, thank you very much. And um, today I would like to share um, about the connection between physical activity and nutrition. And to be very specific, I'd like to talk about how getting enough protein in your diet can help you build muscle and why having that muscle is really important, especially for older adults. So I'm gonna to try to explain why you should consider becoming pro-protein. Um, and there are three main areas I'd like to discuss. Um, very briefly, I'd like to talk about why protein is important for older adults, um, why it's important to preserve your muscle mass, especially as you get older. And then I'd like to finish up with some very practical ideas for how you might get enough protein in your diet. So starting off, um, in terms of talking about why protein is important for older adults, um, we might begin by asking what, what is protein? And it might be helpful to distinguish between the protein in our food and the protein in our body. So <clears throat> protein in our food is a nutrient and it's an essential nutrient, which means that we need to eat protein on a very regular basis every day in order to live. And in our body, Protein is the building block for every cell, which means that every part of your body is made of protein. Um, skin, hair, bones, blood, hormones, <clears throat> muscle, and uh, I'll definitely be coming back to muscle because it's very important. Okay, protein's role in the body is absolutely foundational. It's required for all the structures and functions of our body. For example, protein forms the bones of our skeleton and the muscles of the framework. Protein is needed for um, whenever the body makes, heals, or repairs tissue. And protein forms the antibodies, which allow our immune system to fight off disease. And of course, protein is needed to make the muscles we need for all of our physical movement. So let's talk more about protein. Um, for older adults, it is especially important to eat enough protein to help preserve your muscle mass. And that is to avoid losing too much muscle mass over time. We know that as we age, there is a gradual loss in muscle mass, and this is a very natural process. Also, as we age, we know that the body becomes less efficient in making muscle. So as a, re a result of this, older adults need to eat more protein than younger adults. And you may wonder, why is it so important to preserve muscle mass? Why is muscle so very important, especially for older adults? Well, we know that muscle is needed for all the daily activities of life. Um, it provides the strength that we need for any kind of physical activity or movement. Um, muscle protects against weakness and fatigue. It allows us to balance and be stable on our feet. And, and in doing so, it helps us to avoid falls, injuries, and disability. Muscle gives us the strength to do all the things we need to do, as well as all the things that we enjoy doing. And so in this way, muscle promotes and enables independence and contributes to um, improved quality of life. Making muscle requires two things protein in our diet and resistance exercise. And Rasha already talked um, a little bit about resistance exercise earlier on. So I just wanna add to that. Um, so first of all, when we make muscle, we need to have enough protein um, in our diet for the muscle to be, to be made. Um, and the protein that we eat in our food is broken down in the body into amino acids, which are the building blocks of muscle. So we cannot make muscle without a ready supply of these building blocks. And secondly, we also need resistance exercise in order to, to um, build muscle. And as Rasha was talking about, resistance exercise is exercise in which the muscles are contracting repeatedly against um, an opposing force, and it's often called strength training. Um, and what it does um, with respect to making muscle is that resistance exercise takes the amino acid building blocks that we've got from eating food, from eating protein, and reforms them into muscle in our body. So it's important to remember that both dietary protein and resistance exercise are necessary to build muscle. And now finally, we get to food and nutrition. So if you agree that it's good, that it's important to have enough muscle, and we know that we need to eat enough protein in order for this to happen, you may be wondering, 
How do I get enough protein in my diet? And when I think about um, good sources of protein in the diet, I like to think of sort of five broad, very broad um, categories of food or broad groups of foods that provide good sources of protein. Um, first of all, um, there's the group of meat, fish, and poultry. So this would be beef, pork, chicken, turkey, um, fish, shrimp, tuna, salmon, all of those things um, fall into that group. And the second group is eggs, which is not really a group, but I never know where to put it. So eggs is um, eggs are another good source of protein in the diet. Then there is the group of milk, excuse me, and milk products. So that would be things like yogurt, cottage cheese, milk, cheese, um, things like that. Um, and then uh, there's the group of legumes, which is, um, uh, which is consists of dried peas and beans. So chickpeas, lentils, soybeans, you know, pinto beans, kidney beans, um, tofu, soy beverage, anything that's made of soy. I wanna distinguish here that, um, that legumes do not include vegetables. So they do not include um, green peas and they do not include green beans or yellow wax beans. We're talking about dried peas and beans here. And finally, the last sort of um, broad group of food that provides um, uh, protein in our diet is nuts and seeds. So again, peanuts, walnuts, almonds, uh, pumpkin seeds, hazelnuts, sunflower seeds, um, chia seeds, these are all sources of protein, as well as nut butters. So for example, peanut butter or other butters that are made from nuts like almond butter, et cetera. Okay, and so this I have to apologize is a little bit small, but it's a list of some common foods um, in the diet. And on the far right column, you can see the amount of protein that is provided by each of these foods. And when you look at this um, table, you can see at the top that the large numbers of protein are coming from the meat, poultry, and seafood groups. These are very rich sources of protein. And then underneath, you can see um, a list of some examples of of legumes, um, and uh, you can see that they provide a moderate amount of protein in the diet. And on the next page, we have, um, you can see nuts and seeds also uh, contain moderate amounts of protein, and uh, dairy or milk products offer moderate to high amounts of protein. Okay, so, um, and now I'd like to sort of talk about very practically keeping these sort of groups of food uh, that have protein to speak very practically um, to give some ideas for how you might increase protein in your diet. So uh, first of all, it's very important to spread your protein intake evenly throughout the day. That is, don't eat all your protein all at once. Your body makes muscles more efficiently when you eat protein at regular intervals um, across the day. That just, your body does a better job of incorporating um, the protein in your food into muscles when you spread it out evenly throughout the day. So if you tend to have one high protein meal, say at dinner, which is very common, you may need to add more protein to like earlier in your day to breakfast or lunch. And it's very common for people to sort of have low protein intake at breakfast. So if that's the case for you, um, you could think about maybe having um, eggs or cottage cheese, um, peanut butter, milk, ham. These are all high protein foods that might fit well for, for breakfast. As well, you might consider adding high protein snacks between your meals. So some examples of high protein snacks might include a handful of nuts, a cup of yogurt, some roasted soybeans, trail mix, um, some canned tunas, some canned tuna, <laughs> some uh, cheese and crackers, some uh, vegetables and hummus maybe. Um, of course, the hummus would be the, the source of protein and, and not the vegetables. So those are some examples of some high protein snacks you might add between meals as well. It might be helpful to um, cook larger high protein meals and then freeze the extras for later. That might help as well. For example, you might cook up a large batch of chili um, eat some in at the for one meal and then freeze the extras. You might, if you're cooking chicken breasts or putting them on the barbecue, you might consider um, cooking up several at a time again and freezing the extras for later on. 
Um, you might think about adding beans, uh, canned beans or, or cooked beans to soups or stews. Um, in terms of convenience, uh, canned beans and lentils and things like that, they're very convenient and very inexpensive. So that's an easy way to add um, protein and they go well in soups and stews. Um, eat fish and seafood more often. Fish and seafood are an excellent source of protein. They're also, um, they have all kinds of other um, nutritional benefits as well. Um, you, you might think about putting more cheese into your diet. So you can put cheese on your burgers, on your wraps, um, in your sandwiches, or you know, grate it on, on, um, on foods as well. You might think about sprinkling nuts and seeds onto your salad or onto your oatmeal or onto your breakfast cereal in the morning. As well, um, other ideas might include boiling eggs and storing them in the fridge. So make, make a couple at a time and, and keep them in the fridge. Um, eggs make a, a pretty uh, convenient snack and source of protein. Um, add shrimp, add beef or pork to stir fries or and or you could add things like almonds and cashews to your vegetable stir fry that also increases the protein content. You could try tuna salad or salmon salad or chicken salad sandwiches, or you might even um, uh, include a glass of milk or soy beverage with your meal. I should note here too that when you're looking for uh, protein in, um, in fluids, uh, milk is a source, like cow's milk is a source, Soy beverage is a source of protein, but the other milks are not. So almond milk and oat milk, for example, these are low sources of protein. I think that um, um, the industry is starting to add protein into almond milk. So we might see that coming in the future. But at the moment right now, if you're looking for protein um, in milk, um, it should be cow's milk or soy beverage. And then finally, I just wanted to say, um, sometimes people struggle to get enough protein from the foods that we eat. And while it's, it's always best to get protein in actual foods, if you are finding it difficult um, to do that, you could also try um, protein powders, um, protein shakes, or uh, protein bars. Those are also excellent sources of protein and very, very convenient. Okay, so in conclusion then, why should you consider becoming pro-protein? Well, um, preserving muscle mass is essential for independence and quality of life. We know that muscle is made by um, the protein we eat in our food combined with resistance exercise. And in order to preserve muscle mass, older adults need to eat more protein. It's important to ensure that you're eating a diet rich in protein. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. I must say I was a bit distressed to hear that almond milk has not a lot of protein in it. <laughs> Knowing that I'm a big almond drink uh, person in our family and had to substitute that because of some milk allergy issues, but um, good to hear that they are at least planning to supplement with protein in the future. And uh, so that's helpful. Thank you again so much for the practical information that you presented today. I think, you know, we hear a lot about protein. Um, we may not have necessarily made that link to the resistance training. So thank you so much for doing that for us, especially as it relates to the 24 hour guidelines. And um, I suspect lots of folks will be running out to look at how they can increase their protein <laughs> compliment today. So the next um, portion of our session is an opportunity to move into our question and discussion format. And thank you so much. We recognize it's not always easy to hold questions till the very end, but we wanted to make sure that we were able to get through all of the content for you today. And once again, thank you to our speakers for keeping to your timelines. It has enabled us to have uh, a good uh, portion of time now to address some of the questions. I see in our question and answer chat that we have had three that have popped up. So what I think I'll do is just address each one and call out the speaker who it's most likely to be for. And then, but please, for the rest of you as speakers, if you have additions to add to that question, um, please go ahead and unmute yourself. So the first question that came to our attention is, is a consistent seven hour sleep from 1.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. harmful to health because it's so late? And I'm assuming this question would be best at this point answered by Kathy Summers. 
I'll try my best, but you might not like the answer. You heard me say earlier that we're still trying to iron out exactly what are hard numbers to go by. I usually ask my clients to keep a sleep diary so that they can, can figure out, most importantly, do you feel rested from the sleep that you're getting? So it sounds like there's seven consistent hours there and it's a consistent, that sounds really good. The only thing I would ask you to be aware of is that, um, Night owls do tend to have later bedtimes like this. It is part of their circadian rhythm. But as you age, keep an eye on it. Our circadian rhythm begins shifting and the people who are night owls become not quite so much of a night owl anymore. If your body sort of seems to be getting tired earlier or wants to get up earlier, then I would suggest then is a the time to start thinking about shifting to an earlier bedtime and an earlier wake up time. But for now, probably sounds okay. Just listen to your body. Thanks so much, Kathy. Any feedback from um, Kathy L or Russia? No, I see head nods. Okay, great. We'll move to our next question, uh, which is, is it a good idea to consider a standing computer desk so we don't sit as much? Now I'm gonna direct this to Russia. Thank you, Susie. Um, it is definitely a good idea to consider a standing computer desk. However, I understand that it's not always possible. Um, so for those who cannot switch from a sitting desk to a standing desk is to just try to break up those long periods of sitting as often as possible. Uh, so there isn't a specific recommendation as to how often. So it just uh, vaguely says, as, as often as you can. Uh, and uh, obviously when you're doing uh, your computer work, standing that does count as a light intensity physical activity. So there are health benefits for um, switching to that. Thanks so much, Russia. And I, I do love that linkage with it contributing to that light physical activity. I think there in a given day, I try as much as possible <laughs> to find ways of building up those increments. So thank you so much. Okay. Okay, so our next question is a great one, and it's one that I think all of us have struggled with at some point. How do I avoid gas from eating beans? I'm going to direct that to you, Kathy L. Okay, good question and very relevant. Yes. Okay. So first of all, I, I would say that if you're eating beans um, that come from a can, so canned beans, which are very convenient, um, you always want to dump out all the water and rinse it well. Do not, do not eat that water. <laughs> um, so start there. I would start with that. Um, the other idea is that um, allow your body to sort of get used to, um, get used to the extra gas that, that beans produce over time. So small amounts, just sort of slowly, gradually ease your body into eating um, the, the beans. Uh, that might help. As well, um, I do find that there are products out there like Beano that, um, that, that give us um, enzymes that help to break down um, the components in the beans that are giving us gas. So, so very practically in my own home, because we do eat beans, <laughs> I always bring the Beano out and I put it on the table and everybody has one. And I, I find that that really definitely helps. And it doesn't have to be brand name Beano. It's just you want to um, find uh, one of these products that does help reduce gas and, and it is effective. So um, make sure that if you're eating canned beans, that you're rinsing them well. Um, ease into the, um, into, into the beans, just slow amounts often, and consider uh, a product like Beano. And I, I really do think that will help with the gas. And I think also, um, uh, you know, getting up and moving afterwards so that your body can kind of start working out some of that gas would also be helpful. Thank you so much, Kathy. And thank you for that question. Really appreciate it. It's probably on everyone's minds, but not everyone has the courage to step forward. So appreciate that. Our next question, um, I believe is for you as well, Kathy. What about protein for seniors who are vegan or plant-based? Okay, so when we um, when I went over those list of foods that are high in protein, there are definitely some that would meet the criteria for vegan, um, and those would be mostly um, the legumes and the nuts and seeds. So foods from those groups are going to um, are going to be vegan. 
if um, you are struggling um, as a vegan to get enough protein in your diet, which I actually think from a practical standpoint would be a struggle, I would consider um, looking at adding in a protein powder. And um, usually when I talk about, when we consider which protein powder to choose, I normally would recommend whey protein powder just because it does a better job of building muscle. But if you're vegan, um, you're not gonna want whey. Uh, there are other types of um, protein powders, vegan protein powders on the market, for example, pea protein powder, which are made, it's made from legumes. So um, you might need to, um, you might need to look at adding protein powder into your diet if you're vegan and struggling to get enough. Thanks so much, Kathy. I, I'm sure you do receive that question quite a bit. It is certainly one that I've heard from my vegan colleagues that is an ongoing struggle for them just to maintain the, uh, the right amount of protein. So thank you. Our next question um, is for sleep. Does oxygen saturation drop during sleep? I'm wondering, Kathy Summers, if you could address that. It's an excellent question and I might ask my co-presenters to ask me for advice on this one. My suspicion is that usually it would not drop very much. However, if somebody has sleep apnea or sleep disordered breathing or they're hyperventilating that then there may be uh, big changes with this and we would definitely want to make sure that it's addressed. Um, I'm more, more familiar with the CO2 levels than the O2 levels and what we want to have happen with those. Um, and so uh, that, that's what my suspicion is the answer for that question. But if anybody else has more to add, please jump in. Russia or Kathy, any comments? It's a great question. And um, thank you so much for uh, our participant who asked it. And uh, I'm sure that we, um, with in addition to Kathy's response, I'm sure that there must be some literature out there that we could also source out for you. So we'll, um, we can uh, certainly uh, forward that to you if you have continued questions related to that specific oxygen saturation. Now I'm checking the chat and I'm not seeing any more questions. Do want to give it a minute or two for people to type in if you're just doing that. And if you have that history of, of uh, like some of us do, of the sort of one finger pecking in, it takes a bit of time to get your question in. So we will um, leave the chat question answer open for a minute. And in the meantime, I did have a question and it was specifically for you, Russia, around the Mets. So mm. that's a, a common concept that was newer to me and maybe newer to some of our participants. And so I wondered if you wouldn't mind just reviewing that one more time for us, because I wasn't certain about how myself as an individual might be able to gauge that in a given day. I wondered if you had any practical tips around that. Yeah, um, Don, if you don't mind pulling that slide, it might be easier to just have all of the Mets break down there. Um, it was for the light intensity physical activity slide. Um, so over here, yeah, this one. Yeah, thank you so much, Don. Uh, so METs, you wanna think about it as a, a with short form metabolic equivalence. And you wanna compare it about, you wanna compare it with the energy that you use when you're sitting still. So you, when you're resting and not doing much energy, uh, that is considered one MET. So when an activity is three METs, that means you're exerting three times the energy. And so light intensity uh, would be anything uh, less than three METs, uh, but more than 1.5, because if it's less than 1.5, then it's considered uh, sedentary. And then um, in the next slide shows that for um, uh, the moderate and uh, vigorous uh, intensity, you have three to 5.9, uh, mats. Um, so you're exerting three times or uh, six times more energy than you would if you were sitting still. And then for vigorous, it's six times or more energy than if you were sitting still. And people always uh, ask me like, oh, is um, walking really fast considered moderate or vigorous? And um, my my answer about intensity is that it is always relative. Uh, so for me, for instance, uh, if I was walking really fast uh, because I run, I find that walking really fast is moderate, but I find running vigorous. But if someone does not walk really fast on a daily basis, 
they might find that walking really fast is actually vigorous. So it's, it's quite relative and you want to think about, okay, how hard am I working here? And you want to, uh, and a very easy rule, instead of thinking about it in terms of METs, because it may be a little bit more confusing, you can use the talk test. So while you're walking really fast, try and see if you can um, talk. And if you're able to talk but not sing, that means you're working at a moderate intensity. But if you're walking really fast and you're trying to talk and you see that you can't talk more than a few words without pausing for a breath, that means you're engaging in um, vigorous intensity. So uh, again, intensity is relative. For instance, I find yoga very challenging. <laughs> so for me, that uh, would be pretty vigorous while I'm doing that. But someone else who does yoga on a regular basis might uh, consider it moderate, maybe even light. It depends on how experienced the individual is. Um, so, so, the ex so I can't give you specific examples as to what counts as moderate or vigorous. You just want to think about how hard am I working while engaging in this activity. However, the examples for light intensity physical activity um, are quite universal, you know, in terms of like doing household chores, uh, you know, doing the dishes um, or like grooming, uh, getting dressed, stuff like that. Anything that you're doing, uh, standing, um, that requires a little bit of effort, um, but it gets a little bit more complicated when we enter the moderate to vigorous intensity. Actually, sorry, it was a long answer, but I hope <laughs> that, addressed, that addressed it all. Did. And um, Russia, just a quick question from a participant. How much light intensity levels per day or week is recommended? Yeah, so the recommendation uh, indicates several hours. Um, that's what it puts in the guidelines. They didn't uh, provide a specific um, cutoff. Um, so you just want to try to, uh, again, minimize sedentary behavior and try to reallocate time from being sedentary to uh, being to engaging in light intensity physical activity. And that would include, say, you are sitting uh, for most of the day, you're breaking up those long periods of sitting by standing. You know, now that we work from home, we can get up and just do a few chores in between. And then that all counts as light intensity physical activity. Um, so you just wanna aim for several hours. However, for moderate to vigorous, that one, we have a specific um, cutoff, uh, like a recommendation of at least 150 minutes per week. So that's about an average of 20 minutes a day. Um, but for light intensity physical activity, just think, you know, the more the better and, Anytime you're spending time doing light intensity physical activity, you are taking time away from being sedentary. So again, you're kind of doing both. You are minimizing sedentary and increasing physical activity. So you are progressing towards those um, guideline recommendations. Thank you so much. Okay. And I think, Don, I'm, I'm handing it over to you now. I believe we are imminently near our completion. That's quite right, Susie. And thank you so much for your excellent facilitation of today's session and especially to our presenters today. Uh, I think you've shared such Im important information that we can all easily apply in small steps on a daily basis, just to improve, take further steps to improve our health as we age. You know, the Waterloo Wellington Older Adult Strategy is really was envisioned as a 10 year comprehensive plan to optimize uh, the health of an aging population in Waterloo Wellington. And, and, and really to strengthen the systems that support healthy aging. So obviously health promotion is a key aspect of what we look at within our work on the strategy. And we'd encourage you to follow us on Twitter at WWOlderAdults. So before I thank one, one final time our speakers, I'd like to remind you of the, the fourth and final episode in our Knowledge Exchange series, Celebrating Seniors Month that's happening next week. And we'll be talking about at the same time next Wednesday, protecting and empowering older adults at risk. And we're pleased to be presenting that session in collaboration with the Elder Abuse Prevention Council locally. So please join us for that. We've all just celebrated uh, last week World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. And this will give us some further information as a community and uh, society members on how to better protect and help enable the empowerment of older adults who may be uh, facing risks. So before we uh, sign off with this, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us. And I'd like you to remember what Maya Angelou always says, uh, every storm runs out of rain and indeed uh, this one shall too. Uh, 
Uh, we are rounding the corner in this province, although our community in Waterloo Region uh, seems certainly stressed at the moment. Um, we look forward to coming together with people again soon. And throughout the rest of this month and every day in our lives, we celebrate and thank older adults for all they do for our society and in our communities. So one final opportunity to thank Susie, our facilitator, Kathy, Kathy and Russia, our presenters for today, and a, a, a really strong heartfelt thanks to my colleague, Giselle Loyola, who's been working behind the scenes with us. You'll hear from Giselle tomorrow morning uh, with an email uh, that you'll receive, and it will come from our admin team, and it will include the PowerPoint presentation for today, the recording, a copy of the recording or a link to the recording, and you'll also have an opportunity to tell us what you thought about today uh, by way of our evaluation. So I bid you all a fine day, and thank you again for joining us, and we hope to see you next week. Thank you very much, and take good care. Bye-bye.